I'm going to call the meeting to order. Uh, call to order the September 15, 2015 planning board meeting. Uh, we'll take the agenda in the following order. Approval of minutes for August 18 and September 1 workshop. Old business, Barry subdivision and Broad Cove subdivision amendments. And other business would be Village Green Town Center zoning amendment, and then public comment on items not on the agenda. Um, so, start with minutes for the meeting of August 18. Any changes, any errors or omissions? I'm seeing shaking heads. <laughs> Do I have a motion? Go ahead, John. Uh, motion that we approve the minutes from August 18, 2015. Do I have second. a second? All right. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay. Carries. Um, September 1, 2015 workshop minutes. Go ahead, Jonathan. On the, um, I guess it would be the fourth full paragraph down, there's a. Um, Mr. Chalet asked if the committee discussed village green maintenance cost. I actually think that was me. Yeah, it was who, you. Okay. So I would make a, um, a motion to amend that to Mr. Sarbeck asked if the committee discussed village green maintenance cost. Okay. Anything else? Maureen, did you get that? Yeah. No other changes? I, uh, oh, go ahead. Take Tote Road. And I'm no, nope, you're on the wrong thing. On the wrong one? Sorry. Uh, we're at the September 1st workshop oh, sorry. meeting minutes. Yeah, sorry. No, no comment. All right. Any, uh, all right. Do I have a motion? Go ahead, Elaine. Motion to approve the minutes as amended. A second. Victoria. All right. All those in favor? Opposed? All right. We move on to. Barry subdivision, Broad Cove subdivision amendments. William S. Holt is requesting amendments to the previously approved Barry subdivision located on Two Lights Road and Hannaford Cove Roads, and the Broad Cove subdivision located on Running Tide Road to amend lot lines by merging abutting land. Section 16-2-5, amendments to previously approved subdivision public hearing. Prior to that, could we have a Overview by our town planner and then a presentation by the applicant. Yes. So, um, again, this is a request by Dr. Holt to amend two subdivisions, and basically the subdivisions are being amended because the individual lot lines are being changed, the lots are growing in size. Any change to a lot line triggers a subdivision amendment. Uh, I do want to point out that um, the board tabled this item from last month's meeting. You held a public hearing last month. You're not a required to hold another public hearing. Typically, you hold public comment every single month. Um, it, you did not table this as a public hearing, but we did send out notices saying there was a public hearing. So please allow the public to comment. That's all. All right. Would the uh, applicant like to make presentation. I know there have been uh, changes since the last meeting. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Mitchell, Mitchell & Associates, and I represent uh, Dr. Holt. Um, <clears throat> just to sort of uh, summarize uh, the project, uh, the, what is shaded in brown is the, uh, the Holt property. It's 27 acres. It extends from the, uh, the ocean back approximately 1,600 feet uh, to the rear property line. Uh, access is off of the end of Running Tide Road, and there's a strip of land that is located um, that has frontage on Running Tide Road. Uh, the <coughs> lot four of the uh, Berry subdivision is shaded in blue. Uh, Dr. Holt uh, owns this as well. This is approximately three acres. And then the Wasserman land uh, is shaded in green and uh, has access off of Running Tide Road. The proposal, just to, to summarize the uh, 
where we are uh, in terms of the, the proposal, Dr. Holt, is there are three parts to this proposal. The first is to create a 10.5 acre lot um, where Mr. and Mrs. Holt reside currently. Um, this is referred to as the estate lot. Uh, as I mentioned, it has access off of Running Tide Road here. And this is, uh, <clears throat> it's created as an estate lot to, to sell at some point in the future. The green is a, um, a parcel of land consisting of 4.3 acres that is being proposed to be merged uh, with the Wasserman property. And then the remaining portion of the whole property is shaded in blue. Um, and the proposal here is to um, convey or merge, I should say, the remaining portion of, of the whole property, which amounts to 13 acres with lot four of the Berry subdivision. We believe that we have uh, addressed all of the issues in the comments or, um, by the planning board and um, most of the comments that we received um, at the last hearing from the public. Uh, beginning with the uh, beginning with the Berry subdivision, amended Berry subdivision. Um, as I mentioned, the proposal, we've changed the proposal uh, from our previous submission. We're proposing now to uh, merge uh, the remaining portion of the Berry, uh, the Holt property, in with lot four. Uh, by doing this, uh, it does a couple things. It, it uh, provides frontage, road frontage to the back land, which uh, otherwise the back land would uh, be a, a non-conforming lot. And uh, secondly, it, it, we're basically surrendering the 13 acres, um, the undeveloped 13 acres, and um, providing, giving that to the planning board uh, control. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the covenants, uh, the Berry subdivision covenants, um, and uh, by combining these two pieces of land, the covenants of the Berry subdivision now are going to encumber not only Lot 4, but the entire 16 acres. And there was also a comment at the last planning board meeting to uh, take the applicable notes off of the Berry subdivision, uh, uh, subdivision plan and to put them on this subdivision plan. And we've done that. There are three notes and they've been outlined in our cover letter to you. Um, I'm just going down my, uh, basically my outline of the cover letter. Uh, the third item was uh, building envelopes. We have decreased the, uh, the building envelope uh, considerably, uh, so the edge of the building envelope is located here as opposed to the entire lot. Uh, we've also removed the building envelope um, from the RP2 wetlands. There was also uh, some comments regarding traffic. Um, as you know, uh, traffic was reviewed during the 2010 very subdivision um, project and uh, by the planning board. And since Dr. Holt is only proposing one lot, uh, traffic is not an issue. The fifth item had to do with the tote pathway. Um, and in your packet uh, is a letter that has been uh, submitted by attorney Charles Cates Levy uh, that basically outlines the rights uh, their private rights and uh, should not affect uh, the amended subdivision. And the last item um, under the lot four, under the Berry subdivision, has to do with future development of lot four. And aside from the fact that Dr. Holt has testified, he's written a letter, uh, that he has no intention of um, developing 
uh, or a building on lot four other than his retirement home, um, any future division of this parcel, including any roads, private access ways, will have to come before the planning board for review. And since it probably uh, will come up during the public comment, um, I do want to say that uh, Dr. Holt is not interested in um, entertaining any uh, access restrictions on Lot 4. The, um, the Jordan Farm section of Broad Cove Amendment, um, this is the property that is going to be conveyed to the Wassermans. It's a 4.3 acre parcel out of the Holt property. And uh, the, the proposal is to basically just convey it to the Wassermans. Um, there is a, as you can see, there is a 250 foot setback from the RP1 wetland that encumbers um, a good portion of this property. Uh, the two items here uh, had to do with the building envelope. We've amended the subdivision plan to include the building envelope on the existing lot. And the number, the number two had to do with future development. And again, any future development of, um, of uh, a private access way uh, will have to come back to the planning board for planning board review. And the, uh, the final uh, plan has to do with the estate lot. Um, we wanted to address the potential development of the estate lot uh, since there were several questions about that, and we prepared uh, this exhibit, which is in your packet, um, indicating that there are two zoning restrictions that would prohibit uh, any development on the 10-acre piece. The first, number A, uh, has to do with the dead-end ro road uh, regulation that has greater than 20 dwelling units, um, and because of that, Running Hill Road is a dead-end road. It has, greater than, it has more than 20 lots, uh, therefore um, no future lot can be developed on the 10-acre lot without uh, creating an additional second means of access. In the second zoning regulation, um, number B has to do with this uh, strip of land uh, that extends out to running hill, uh, running tide lane. <clears throat> uh, and you can see the, this is the RP1 250 foot zoning or setback, uh, wetland setback um, that would prohibit uh, any access from running tide lane onto this property. Um, again, we feel that we have um, addressed your comments um, and most of the neighbors' comments. Um, we are definitely um, uh, mo we're moving in the direction of, of where the neighbors uh, uh, wanted us to uh, by merging the um, by merging the uh, lot four uh, and the remaining property of the whole property. Um, so I'd be glad to answer any questions. Go ahead. Um, can you go back to the slide showing the Wasserman property merged with the uh, yep. new piece? Okay, so I, is there a building envelope on the new piece as well? No, there isn't. No. That's by choice? Or? By choice, yeah. Okay. So if they wanted to, because that land is buildable, right, in the back there? I mean, if they wanted to remove their house from its present location and rebuild a house in the back portion of the lot. They would have to come before the planning board. 
And that's only because you've chosen not to in, yeah. put the um, building envelope in the back there. Correct? That's correct, yeah. Okay. Yep. Any other questions before we move on? Yeah. I have a number of questions, but I think I'd rather wait till after the public, public comment. comment. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Thank you. So we will hold a public comment period and then the board will discuss the item. <coughs> Is there anyone? Okay. Thank you. So anyone wishing to speak, if you come forward to the microphone, give your name, your address. You have three minutes in which to speak and offer your comment. Thank you. Uh, I just have a question. Uh, my name is Jim Atlison at Seven Winding Way, which is at the very end of Winding Way and actually should be on Jordan Farm Road. So it is just on your graph there. It's just to the left of the, the Wassermans, the proposed Wassermans lot. So our question is, uh, what's the, and I, this might be irrelevant to your, to your job, but what's the potential for development of the area to the left of the Wasserman Slot, which is in my backyard? Was that, which is the, is that the whole clear lot. enough? The whole lot. The lot that Dr. Holt is, the three yes. acres, okay. Yes, what's the potential for the development of that lot or the whatever direction that that is to the right? Let me take a stab at that. Yeah. You can take a stab at it. You can wait until the public comment period is over and ask the applicant to come up. It's your choice. Well, just in general, the potential of development of anyone's property is open should they meet the right criteria and come to the planning board and go through. So there's always potential. I know I'm making this sound worse than it is, but we have a gentleman who has professed to not want to develop the lot. Yeah. And, but that doesn't mean that 30 years from now, someone could come down the road and buy your lot, his lot, that lot, and develop it. There, there's nothing to stop that except them meeting the or the rules of the zoning ordinances. Okay. Would any uh, one more question? Would any sale of any part of that blue air area require approval of Everything the town? Everything that would happen in that blue area requires them to come back here to the planning board. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Anyone else? Good evening, board members. My name is Mary Costigan. I'm with Bernstein Shore. I'm here tonight on behalf of Mr. Tom Egan, who's unavailable to be here tonight. I'm just going to scooch this over. Mr. Egan lives, owns property at 41 Hannaford Cove Road, which is um, just adjacent to the current lot four. Um, there's a, a letter from me in your packet, and it is identified by this orange strip on the bottom here. Um, and you know, the, the gist of our comments, and, and Mr. Mitchell alluded to it earlier, is a request that this board condition any approval of this subdivision um, amendment with the following condition. Any and all access to and from Hannaford Cove Road to Lot 4 shall serve only one dwelling unit. And the purpose for that um, request is that currently uh, this, the Berry subdivision has four lots, each with one building envelope for one single family home. Um, by increasing the, the, the development potential here, um, we believe it's a, a violation of the current subdivision plan um, to increase development potential to that property to allow possibly more than one uh, single family home. And we think the way to resolve this the best is just to limit access to that property to one single family home. Um, it reflects Dr. Holt's current intentions. Um, it would I can't speak for any of the, the landowners in the subdivision itself who may have private rights of action outside of the planning board process, but it would stop any of that from going forward and provide um, 
some surety to the neighborhood that this will remain a single family lot as uh, set forth in the original subdivision. I just wanted to follow up on a couple of things that Mr. Mitchell mentioned, um, just to clarify. One of the things that he mentioned is that the new amendment actually reduces the size of the building envelope. And I was a little confused by that because it actually increases the size of the building envelope on lot four. What it, lot, the building envelope of lot four right now does not extend into the back portion. And the proposal is to extend that building envelope into the back portion. So it actually amends the building envelope itself in addition to just the lot line. So I just wanted to clarify that. I don't know how it's defined as a decrease in the building envelope when actually it does increase the, the building envelope as it exists today on lot four. Um, the other note um, is that he mentioned that conditions were taken from the original subdivision and placed on this amendment. And I just want to note that the, the condition that's currently on the subdivision plan for the Barry subdivision, it's note 12, it says construction on land outside the building envelope, so the building envelope that's on lot four right now, um, on each lot shall be limited to the installation of driveways, utilities, and septic systems. Well, that was carried over, but it was also added on to that um, with the following exceptions. And so that note was not only carried over, but it was amended. And I just wanted to make sure that the board was aware of that. And that's clear. Right now on this amendment, it's uh, uh, note 13. Um, it talks about um, installation of driveway and utilities with certain exceptions, including structures related to agricultural uses um, and, and tree and vegetation and removal of trees, et cetera. So just to clarify that that note has actually been amended. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak? Go ahead. Um, yeah, we've been here before. I'm Patty Morris, and my husband's with me, Ron Balin. We live at number 26 Hannaford Cove Road, right across from Dr. Holt's um, vineyard and diagonally from where his new home will be. We wish him well with that, um, genuinely. Um, I just wanted to reiterate a few things I submitted in written comments um, that are before you now, too, but highlight some things. So our stories are all important here, we believe. Um, they are at bottom why there is planning and reliance on reasonably predictable results from careful planning. In our case, I raised my three kids in Cape Elizabeth on the cookie jar side of town, which they loved, <laughs> and um, I loved because I could see you know, them out there with their friends and common yards and all that kind of stuff. It served our needs. My husband and I fast forward to like four or five years ago, 24 years after all that, wanted to move to something more private. We're now empty nesters. It makes sense for us. Our big emphasis on leaving a home we love on the other side of town, we adored that home. We had the shipping channel as a view. We were astounded we could even afford that home. <laughs> we negotiated to afford that home. So we gave up a lot over there because we wanted to find a place in Cape that very specifically had more privacy for us. And we don't feel like we're entitled to privacy that anybody else isn't. We only have what we bought. We understand that. But we ad nauseum researched every single property that was available in Cape that had any remote appeal to us at the time. And we, that included visiting town hall and the planning office over and over and over again. And we came out of there with as close as you can get to assurances that behind us wasn't developable and across from us was just very minimal chance that would ever be developed. Now we're facing something different and we would not have bought this house here and invested a loss of $40,000 and other choices we made to be here as we enter our retirement years had the lot been positioned the way it's now um, going to be approved apparently <laughs> so or being moved to be approved. So reliance is the issue here. Um, the Egan's attorney, Mary, has hit on the Arnold case, and the principle there is why folks get upset when reasonable vetted expectations are dismissed. Neighbors rely on planning. So our neighbor, Greg Wolf, is not here tonight, but he's part of the Barry subdivision, and I know he submitted his own written comments, and they're of record, so I'll allude to it, because that goes to reliance, too. And Greg also reliance on the covenants in that case to the building lots, the most important covenant in this consideration. So. Greg has 
also eloquently raised another important consideration, that mediation has long been recognized over litigation in quasi-judicial as well as judicial bodies as something that staves off unnecessary protraction and later litigation and expense and so forth. So he has graciously extended an invitation for Dr. Holt to meet with his family and see if they can clear up any ambiguities over their, what they consider their um, covenants that bind all of those lots. Um, in light of that invitation, I'd ask the board, I know you're going to roll your eyes, but I'd ask the board to table to allow that to happen. The wolves are not available right now. They would like to meet with Dr. Holt. They could talk about what the covenants mean to them and maybe iron out some things, come back with a stronger, more sol solidified solidarity kind of presentation. Um, and alternatively, if that's not going to happen, we respectfully encourage the board to approve, for God's sake, <laughs> Dr. Holt's maximum flexibility on enjoying his beautiful property, um, including placement of his home outside the footprint we believe he's bound to in the Berry Covenants. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. But that he meet his sta the stated intent of relying and his reliance of the neighbors on expanding lot Could you please wrap up? Lot four by retaining a covenant of restriction as now is in place. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. How many people wish to speak? Because it would be much faster if you lined up right behind her and we didn't have to wait for people to, to move out of their seats. So if you want to make a line behind uh, Florence, then you can speak as soon as she's done. If you don't want to, just to expedite things, I just want to see things move quickly. So, <laughs> okay, Mrs. Brown, go ahead. At the risk of being a one-note tune, I wanted to ask again a question I asked at the last meeting. And I was hoping Dr. Holt's attorney could, ask, could answer it. Could you please address the board? Sorry. Sorry. <clears throat> I wanted him to know I was going to ask him again. Yep. Um, I know that the original Berry lot, and presumably the subdivisions, had uh, covenanted beach access. If lot four is now turned into 14 acres, if it's a single house, that's no problem. That's well within the envisioned burden on the beaches. But if it, at some future time, became more than that, I was raising the question, if the beach access travels to the additional 10 acres, uh, well, specifically, does the beach access travel to the traditional, to the, or the 10 acres owned by Mr. Hope, the additional 10 acres, um, would it, the access attached to that, and at some time in the future, although not presently planned, if there were a subdivision, that would, in fact, increase the burden on the beach. And I was figuring, this is something he probably knows the answer to, and I, I noticed that it's minuted, the question, in the last meeting, and I'd love an answer. All right. Thank you for the moment. You're well. My name is uh, Richard Berman. I live at 58 Hannaford Cove Road. And my background was I was a landscape architect for 20 years and for 30 years I've been a real estate developer. Um, you've done a site visit, so you know that Hanford Cove Road is a local neighborhood street. It's not a collector street. In fact, it's 16 feet wide in front of my house. It's a street that kids play in. Dogs, some dogs are unleashed, walk in it, others are leashed. But it's a family-oriented uh, street. When the Berry subdivision came forth, I was in favor of it because it was four lots. I know that each lot, each residence, generates 10 trips, uh, car trips a day. That's the average. So there was 40 extra ins and outs on a Hannaford Cove Road. Um, I don't mind the lot being changed, but I do think it should be restricted to one um, house, and therefore 10, that would generate just uh, 10 ins and outs. Hannaford Cove Road just is, is um, all for um, interconnected streets when they're collector streets. This isn't a collector street. I think there's going to be some unintentional consequences um, that'll make uh, life miserable for the people who live on Hannaford Cove Road. Right now you have one large lot and lot four. One large lot that cannot be subdivided and one on, uh, on uh, Hannaford Cove Ro Road, Lot 4. Again, I don't mind uh, the change as long as it's restricted, and I think the planning board should think hard about that. 
I know that Mr. Holt doesn't want restrictions on it, and if it's unacceptable, then I would wish you would deny this. Thank you. My name is Tana Lenhart. I live at 48 Hannaford Cove Road, and I have a question because I don't know if I heard this correctly or not, but when um, Mr. Holt's lawyer was speaking, I heard that he would entertain no access restrictions on lot four. Did you hear that? And could you explain what that means? No access restrictions on lot four. What does that mean? We don't restrict access to lot four? Does that mean that you could have more than one driveway? What does that mean? We'll address that. We'll address all these questions. When we okay, thanks. Hi, my name is Nancy Bagan, and I live on the other end on the what's called a state property. And I just need some clarification because I'm, I'm not um, uh, understanding. I'm sorry, could you specifically give your address? Seven Running Tide. Thank you. I am to the immediate right of the what I'm going to call right of way. I I'm, don't know what it's called. And I'm to understand that the lot behind me is relatively inaccessible or unable to be built upon because of the wetland restrictions. I believe that is correct. I don't know what the, if, I would like to know what the restrictions are for that lot, if any, that I could read. And secondly, if there are restrictions with regard to what could be done with that lot, then why is that access road so prominently featured. Um, I, if, if it goes nowhere and it has nothing to be done, then why not just, why is it even discussed, I guess is what I'm saying. I, it alarms me that that is there and it's always been there and it continues to be there, wondering whether sometime down the road that may be a, a street or a driveway. And if that were the case, that would be um, not so good for me. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? My name is Eileen Calico and I live at 55 Hannaford Cove Road. Excuse me, I used to own 55, I own 53, that's where I reside, uh, which is, backs up to uh, Dr. Holt's land. And I understand that we're speaking of legal issues and so forth, but I, as many others have mentioned, I would like to reiterate the quality of life that we have enjoyed, or I have enjoyed for the last 40 years on Hannaford Cove Road, and that in addition to the quality of life, I would not like to be equated with not in my backyard. But there is a character that exists as you have seen and as you have walked through that does not allow for development or a change in a large way in terms of buildings and residences and we are a very welcoming neighborhood I think anyone who has moved there or um, built there feels welcome but at the same time we do appreciate and hope to ensure that the quality that we live in and on and around will remain the same with respect and we would very much like to have a conversation with Dr. Holt about his intent and at least some clarity about his issue around access to Hannaford Cove Road. Thank you. Hi, I'm Carol Atlison at Seven Winding Way, which is, as my husband explained, the lot uh, behind my house is the, the end of the blue section abutting the green section that the Wassermans um, are proposing to own. 
And my question is, is there access to that lot for the blue section there off of Jordan Farm Road? Is there potential access off of Jordan Farm Road in order that somebody could eventually develop? No. Okay. Thank you. That was an easy question. Anyone else? You'll get your turn. All right, I'm going to close the public comment period, and we will begin discussion among the board, or do we want to answer some of these questions first? Do you, are some of these your questions, Elaine? Yeah, I would love to have Mr. Katz-Levy answer the legal questions that were raised, and I also had some questions about the um, legal opinion that we have here that relates in part to some of what the public was raising. <clears throat> Thanks, John. Uh, Charlie Katzlevy, uh, representing Dr. Holt. And uh, I know that there was one question about further development on what we call the estate lot shown in brown. And uh, in addition to the wetlands, um, I think uh, Mr. Mitchell explained that the fact that it's a dead end road with more than 20 lots would preclude future division of that lot. So that should not be a concern. There was another legal question about some appurtenant rights that may run with Lot 4 to access a beach area. Um, right now, Lot 4 is allowed to have one single family residence, and that family would be able to enjoy any appurtenant rights that run with the land. And if the lot is increased in size, that one family would continue to enjoy those rights. If the lot were to be further divided, uh, that is very speculative and is not being proposed, and that would have to come back before the planning board if such a proposal ever did exist. But uh, such rights would carry forward unless it was an overburdening. And one would have to examine the grant from the original grant of that easement uh, try and determine uh, whether it was intended to apply to a limited number of lots and whether the scope of that easement had been exceeded. Um, and did I miss any of the questions? Go ahead. Okay, I had um, a, a, cu a couple other questions on your discussion of the tote road. Um, and you indicated that the only current holder of rights across that tote road um, would be John H. Rich, Jr. And I was wondering if you could tell me where that John H. Rich, Jr. lot is. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, I might actually rely on, uh, on John to point it out. Um, I just want to clarify. We talk a lot about a tote road. And... And, and I'm not sure that that's really uh, fairly captures what is physically on the ground. I think you've walked the property. Right. This is a mown path. This is not a public way. This is not a road that's used by numerous vehicles. This is a, a mown path that is used by a select number of private individuals who have private easements, either pedestrian access only or the occasional tractor. So is, is that the same property that when we were doing the site walk you were referring to as the Duffett property or is the Rich property different from the Duffett property? It's the same property. So there's a Duffett property and there's a Rich property because this legal opinion talks about only one property. So that's why I was kind of confused. I think one of the Duffets sold to Rich. That's why it's, it's two pro It was owned by, two, there were two Duffet properties. And then one of the Duffet properties was sold to Rich. So okay, so yeah, I'd have to the opinion is telling me something different. Which I'd, 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 I, I have to review my title file. But the, 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 basic, the basic gist here is that uh, Maud Duffet owned the land. And when she sold it off, uh, she created that original easement, that private easement. Um, and she reserved it. And I um, have trouble remembering whether she conveyed rights to Rich or she subsequently conveyed her reserved land, and that's why two folks now have those rights. But, but the, the key in my mind is that private easement rights are not impacted by this process. There's nothing that the planning board 
would typically have jurisdiction to do regarding those private easement rights over the Moan Path. Except that if my, my understanding is that if those private easement rights affect a subdivision, then those private easement rights must be shown on the subdivision plan. So my, my follow-up question, once I've understood whether Duffett and Rich were one or two properties, because we were on the sidewalk talking about only one, and now it appears there are two owners. But my follow-up question, which I think does affect this, is whether those easement rights apply to the Holt property itself and would then apply to the green property that is being carved out of the Holt property and also apply to the um, blue property? It, 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 yes, it's a matter of title and all of the existing easements that encumber the real estate will continue to encumber the real estate regardless of what happens, whether this application is accepted or denied. There's nothing that can happen here that can modify, terminate, or expand those private easement rights. I understand that, but the easements have to be identified on the subdivision plan in your letter. I was confused okay. by your letter as to whether Dr. Holt himself well, retains. Well, we, we, could, we, could, we could modify the plan to add a note to identify the book and pages of the two private easements if that's requested. So that easement would continue to apply to the expanded lot four were we to accept that, and it would also continue to apply to the Wasserman property, the expanded Wasserman property. Correct. There is nothing that could take place here that would modify those easements. So that would have to be shown both on the Broad Cove subdivision amendment and on this one because it is an easement that's benefiting those subdivision lots. <laughs> but that's okay. I don't think we have any objection. If, if, if the board would like us to add notes of, of the two deed references for existing easements, actually, uh, John is pointing to me. Uh, note 5, reference is made to the following easements of record. Easement from Harvey Maxwell to Maud Duffett, dated August 13, 1929, recorded in deed book 1342, page 240, which I believe is the original creation of the easement. Could that be modified just to identify what it's applying to so that it's clear that there are easement rights on that? Can I, can I, can I, I do know the answer to that question. Sure. I do know the answers to those uh, questions, uh, uh, and the uh, 1928 uh, uh, easement awarded from Harvey Maxwell to Maud Duffett was to allow the Duffetts access to a small cottage, which was in fact the first property on the shore there. At a later date, in order to uh, convenience uh, uh, John Rich, uh, he also, Duffett granted Rich the right to use that road so that he could move part of his current house down that road. Uh, except for that, Rich has never used it. I have, uh, as, as the owner of these, this land, I do not have any right to that right of way. I use it because I own all of it and I can use any part of the land I want. But when I sell it, my understanding is that only the Duffets and the riches will have the right to run motorized traffic up and down that road. I do not. I do not think I will have right. I don't want to assert it. And I don't think the Wassermans will have that right either. Yeah. It's, it's not, it's got nothing to do with Broad Cove. It's a deed, a, a, a restriction given by Maxwell to Duffett. It's never been part of Broad Cove in any way. Okay, you and your lawyer are saying something slightly may, different, if I understand you both. I, I'm not claiming an easement. When no, I no, sell no. this, I don't, I don't intend ever to use that road again. All right. Okay. Thank and you. I, I, just to clarify, I don't know that we've made, reached any final conclusions on when the estate lot is sold and when the Wasserman lot is sold as to whether we would reserve a private right-of-way for the benefit of Lot 4. I don't think it's relevant. I don't Actually, like I think it is very relevant. I think it's relevant. It's quite relevant because the question is the potential for the back part of the Wasserman lot, then subsequently, if it has an easement reserve across the expanded lot four, 
it would also potentially have access to Hannaford Cove Road. I think it's very relevant. Yeah, I, I just want to make sure I understand the comment. The comment is that if the expanded lot four was to reserve a private right to cross the Moan Path, they could tie into Running Tide Road? Is that the... Running, uh, run, no, I'm not talking Sorry. about, I'm talking about Hannaford Cove Road. Running Tide Road, I have another question about that, but not now. Okay. But I, I guess I'm confused by the concern. Can I try to summarize what I've been hearing? Yeah. What I've been hearing is the only people with, with rights to this pathway identified as a tote road is John Rich, I think I got his first name correctly, and the Duffett family. And that, those rights go with the land and have gone with the land since 1928 or 29. And your original question was, please ask them to make that crystal clear on, on, the, on the plans. But they're it a is burden. noted, but they're to make it burden very, on the rich yeah. land, they're not a benefit to the rich land. Yeah. No, they're a benefit. Involved. There's no rich land. They but, burden the rich land because the tote road crosses the rich land. They don't benefit the rich land, and that the they don't benefit any of. You, you, so, ma ma Mr. Holt, John, could you zoom yeah. in to the rich and Buffett lots? So, so uh, you you can't have an easement over your own property. Um, so, Mr. Holt, I don't believe it has beyond the Holt property, does it not? Uh, well, I don't believe that Mr. Holt has a private easement over the rich property, but I do believe that Mr. The end access of it. Where does that tote road goes beyond the end of the blue lot, correct? It goes through the Maxwell property. All the way out the Maxwell property. It goes property. all the way out to two lights. Right? So my two question lights. is, does the Holt property have the benefit of rights on that tote road to go through to the Maxwell property? No. 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 So that's just an easement across his land that someone else has the benefit of. Correct. 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 So that, the, so that the right, the benefit to go across that property over to the Maxwell's is not something that Mr. Holt could use or convey to anyone else. The only thing that Mr. Holt could do is he could reserve an easement to get from lot four to the water. He can't go in the other direction. He can go easterly to the water if he were to reserve an easement over the land he's selling. Oh, but your concern right. about going westerly to the road is a non-issue because he doesn't have those rights. Okay, that's what I was trying to clarify from, I okay. wasn't quite clear as I read I, it. I apologize if I didn't understand it right away. In, in just, okay. Go ahead. On that point, and it's my understanding that Dr. Holt is not asking to preserve an easement for himself across the Wasserman property and the estate lot, is that correct? I, I think that's, uh, that's his opinion uh, as of the moment. I, I don't know. Is, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how it's, it ties into the process because, uh, as his attorney, if I were to advise him when he sells the estate lot to reserve him a private right to the water for himself, I'm not sure how that's relevant to what we're doing here today. But the question at hand is, as these, as this property stands, as the notes are written, as they're presented to us as an application to the planning board, there's nothing on here with regards to the estate lot and the Wasserman lot that allows Dr. Holt an easement? There's nothing on the proposed app. Well, because I think Dr. Holt owns all three parcels at, today, um, I mean, if he decided, and hypothetically it's clear it's not his intention, but if he decided to reserve a private right-of-way, a pedestrian access over the Wasserman lot in that deed, that's something you would want shown on the plan? Well, I'm trying to clarify what yes. Elaine was yes. getting at, so I yes. just want to make okay. sure. Um, Can I ask a question? So, am I correct in understanding this is a pedestrian easement? This is not a 50-foot right-of-way that would allow vehicular traffic, correct? I thought am it I did I, allow vehicular traffic to the Duff's. Duff I'm, I, I'm asked, is that correct? It's a pedestrian the, 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 easement. The, it is the not. easement that I'm contemplating that Dr. Holt... No, could, I'm talking about the easement that is currently on... The scope the of the existing easement? Um, let me take a quick look at my letter. The scope of the existing easement. To, that the, only the Duffets and only the Riches own is for mostly pedestrian access and some vehicular access. But in no point does it specify that it's a 50-foot wide right-of-way. And that's important to the board because if someone wants to create serious access that can support additional development, 
you really need to think about a 50 foot wide right of way. Yeah. And I it, think what Mr. Katz Levy is trying to suggest is that Dr. Holt has not closed the door He's personally reserving to himself a small non 50 foot wide access to the water before he conveys out his estate lot and the Wasserman lot. But at no point is there any proposal to preserve a vehicular access that would support additional development. That was more eloquent than I, that is exactly what I'm trying to, uh, thank we'll you for the summary. <laughs> yeah, no, that, 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 that's the point. I mean, whether he wants to be able to walk to the water, um, that's a conversation we have to have down the road. But right. and, and there's, no, we, there's no 50 foot road. Uh, clarity, yes. I just have a question. It, this, this agreement was made in 1929. Has it ever been modified since then? Yes, 1959. It's in your packet. There's a, there's a, dip, there's a detail of it. And there, were, there was a modification in 1949 and 1959. And was there any reference to, this, to the width of the... Of no, the, no, no. That's uh, we, we, we've looked at it and we've determined that the holders have no right to pave the surface, they have no right to widen the easement, and they have no right to install utilities. So in the original 1929, how wide was it defined as? It it, there's no width. So it, it's, a, it's basically just a walkway. I mean, it can't be anything else. 29, they didn't have very wide vehicles. <laughs> That's our position. So, so for clarity's sake, it's a pedestrian easement. And if uh, Dr. Holt should choose, and when he conveys the property, he, will be, he could get a pedestrian easement to the water as he conveys the property of the other people. But there will be, he is not looking for a 50 foot right away. So Correct. Can we'll I call that good. Can I follow up with one thing? Yep. In terms of what I think we need to see on the plan, and Maureen, maybe you'll confirm it, anything that would be a utility easement benefiting the lot on the subdivision or an access easement benefiting the lot on the subdivision, I think we need to have called out. That's correct? I, I would certainly recommend that. And what I would further suggest is if the board remains concerned about this, you could add a condition to the approval that if there is any conveyance of a utility easement or a vehicular easement, that that would have to come back to the board. Okay. That way it leaves open Dr. Holt sorting out, preserving some opportunity to get to the water from his new home. Okay. Can I ask a follow-up question on the running tide road access question? Again, it's more of a legal interpretation. Um, if I understand what Mr. Mitchell was saying, the estate lot cannot be further subdivided because running tide road is maxed out on development lots. It's already got 20, it can't have more than 20. So I guess my question is, wouldn't that same thing apply to any potential future development on the Wasserman lot that would allow more than one house to be built there so that that lot also, as the ordinances now stand, could not further be subdivided because there is no access no additional access permitted to running tide road. We'll let Maureen handle that. So we have, we have talked about this. The dead end road standard, as you stated, is in the subdivision ordinance, and it says that you can't have a dead end road that's longer than 2,000 feet, nor serve more than 20 homes. Mm -hmm. And pretty much all of running tide road is not in compliance with that. So unless someone creates another way to get in there, and it can be an emergency access road, you cannot do anything there. However, uh, if the Wassermans decided at some point in the future to break off a lot off of their existing lot, they could attain, they could make it a buildable lot and get a building permit if they got a private access way permit. And private access way permits are in the zoning ordinance. So why couldn't the estate lot do the same thing? Um, the estate lot could probably do it for one lot. Okay. So it, it's really, so one more lot could be. Private access way is one lot. And if you do more than one, you trigger private road, 
private road is in the subdivision ordinance and you're right back to dead end road standards. So you're saying there's a and then I guess the kids. only way to do that would be to revisit the um, long discussed and presently no longer open question about making Jordan Farm Road a regular. It still road. wouldn't help because you measure from the point where only dead end one dead end. We actually can count. Opening up that would no, not. Jordan Farm Road counts as a second means of access. It's 18 feet wide. It's an emergency access road that the town has rights to. And there is a maintenance agreement that talks about plowing snow. So you actually can count Jordan Farm Road as a second means of access. But you measure the point from where only one means of access exists. Mm -hmm. And that's the intersection of running tide and I want to say winding way, yeah. winding way. So even if you, oh, even, if you count Jordan Farm Road, what you really need is a connection from the end over to, I'm not going to say it, but there you would have to find another place to connect up to. But so in its, current, in its current configuration mm -hmm. with its current granted access points, the whole property as it now stands not including lot four as it now stands, could allow sure. at least one more. It could allow two more lots because they could do two private access ways. They can only do one. And the Wasmans could do one as well. They, they, only, they only could do one off of the driveway of his existing home. Even though home. they have two deeded access points? That, at, that other access point, it's, it's not a deeded access point. They, uh, he actually owns that land in right. fee. But the wetland information we have for that area shows that the portion of that 50-foot uh, wide strip that's closest to the body of the land mm -hmm. is within a 250-foot wetland buffer. And you're not allowed to build a new road or a new driveway in a 250-foot wetland buffer. So there's just no way you could build something new there. And the board was there at the site walk, and there's no existing driveway in that spot. Right. So and that's wetland that's actually been defined and mapped as opposed to a lot of the wetland on the property. The applicant has, has verified the boundary of the RP1 wetland. So um, there has been field verification, and they've submitted a letter from uh, Alfric Associates verifying the boundaries of RP1, and then you measure out 250 feet from the RP1. So we have a lot of confidence that the RP1 wetland and the RP1 buffer line are in the right spot. I, I was hoping that. Maybe um, Mr. Mitchell could bring up that slide uh, that specifically Zoom goes that to mm -hmm. on the uh, Wasserman. Uh, yes, no, the, Wasserman. The, that 50-foot wide strip that's wet, that's east of the Wasserman to be conveyed lot. The back part of the estate lot. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you. And this actually addresses, I believe, it was um, the Bagans who had that question from the public. John, can you show the one that has the, buff, the wetland buffer, the wetland shown and the wetland buffer? To the oh, west. oh. This is good, but. Well, that's. Um, I got that one. I got it, again. I got it, yeah. And then just pull it over. Area is the buffer. It's the 250 foot wetland buffer. This hat, that hashed area. That's the 250 foot buffer line. And that 50 foot wide area that he owns is? It's right there. Right there. Right. Okay, thank you. All right. Any, anything else from the board on this? Point, or shall we move on to other points? Could you address the question about uh, John's comment about where is it? 
entertain no access, no restriction on no access? access restriction? Or not? Yes. Um, in 2010, for the original Barry subdivision, uh, Mr. Egan made the same request. At that time, he was represented by uh, Attorney Norton. And uh, the same concerns were uh, addressed about um, traffic and future development, and requests were made to restrict, uh, add restrictions about future development of those lots and, uh, and, and so forth. And uh, at the time, I believe it was David Titcomb who was representing the applicant, and he said that um, there was no uh, proposed development or division there, and that uh, any such discussion was speculative and uh, inappropriate. And in 2010, the board accepted that position. And um, we continue to hold that position, which is lot four allows one single family residence. Even if we change the boundary lines, it will allow one single family residence. If some future owner wants to further amend that and seek additional lots, they'll have to come before the planning board. Uh, that's not what we're seeking to do here. And uh, we just don't feel it's uh, necessary or appropriate. Okay. Building envelope, I, I'll address the building envelope on lot four, and I think it was just a matter of semantics. When we looked at the original plan on lot four, the building envelope encompassed all the new property as well as the, um, the it, it encompassed the 13 acres as well as the Barry lot. And when John referred to reducing it, they've, they've moved the building envelope back to to cover just a small portion of the 13 acres and the berry lot. And as far as uh, adding the, the uh, comment about agricultural activity, Mr. Holt would not be able to have his vineyard if that, that piece was not put in there because it would be outside the building envelope. So in order for the vineyard to exist, then that particular note must exist on the plan and uh, because the building envelope has been scoped back. So to answer those two points, I don't know if you guys want to add anything or if that covers it. So what, uh, what other question have we not answered? Have we, an have we answered all the questions that were raised during the public comment period? Uh, yes. Okay. I didn't know if you wanted to respond to the uh, issue that's been raised regarding the court decision and its applicability to this particular. I do. Thank you. There are a number of, is this an appropriate time to, to just address a few of the comments that were made during the public you go comment ahead. session? I might have missed something, so okay. go right ahead. Um, uh, Attorney Costigan um, has cited a case and, um, and others have mentioned that case. And um, if anybody's interested and in looking for a little light reading, I suggest you take a look at the case. Um, the case is not really relevant to the set of facts we have here. That case is about interference with an easement. Um, it's, it deals with the basic proposition that in Maine, when a lot is conveyed on a subdivision plan that shows roads, um, there's a general right of the lot owners to use those roads. In that case, somebody built a house uh, in the middle of one of those roads and, um, and so it was uh, one of the many in the line of cases that say um, that that's not appropriate to, uh, to put a house in the middle of a subdivision road that others have rights to. Um, but it's, it's uh, a very far cry from what we're doing here, which I think is amending a subdivision lot line well within the planning board's jurisdiction. And um, you know, I, I, I hope the planning board is reluctant to uh, cede its jurisdiction and, uh, and um, take the position that uh, it, it can't amend subdivisions because everyone who bought in the subdivision had an expectation that nothing would be changed. Any other points you want to address? Uh, you know, I, I just, you know, the, the access to the back acreage issue and the request, again, that was heavily discussed in 2010. Um, Mr. Titcomb said, uh, there's a letter from Mr. Egan in a butter asking for restrictions on roads within the project. He said there is no reason to comply with this request because there is no road proposed at this time. 
If there was ever any development to happen in the future, which is hypothetical at this point, it would need to be addressed by the planning board at that time. He does not feel it is appropriate to put such a condition on this project now. I mean, the, this exact exercise took place five years ago, and the, and the planning board um, basically accepted the position that uh, Dr. Holt is putting forth now. Um, we're proposing uh, a single lot uh, that would allow for a single family residence, um, which is what is currently allowed on lot four. Um, as such, it should have no impact on traffic. And um, we ask that the, uh, the board consider our request. Uh, we're not interested at this point in mediation. We have not received any invitation to mediate, um, nor do we think uh, it's appropriate. And, uh, and if there are any other questions, we'd be happy to answer them. All right. Thank you. So anyone else on the board have questions? Victoria. I actually have a question for Maureen. And it does, it's a follow-up on what was just said, that there has been a number of um, people that have commented that they would like to see um, a condition of approval, such as the one stated by, um, is this Mr. Egan, um, by, or Mar by Mary Costigan's letter. Any and all access to and from Hanford Cove Road to Lot 4 shall serve only one dwelling unit. Um, in the future, could a planning board with a new set of facts before them override a condition of approval such as the one being suggested? Um, you know, it, I think this board in particular has had many experiences, many reviews where people have returned to amend prior approvals, have returned to ask for changes to, to conditions of approval. So there's really very little that you can put on a plan that a future board can't consider changing. Uh, it's hard to think of things that you couldn't change. And, you know, regarding this, this condition about the access, um, Ms. Costigan called me last week. We had a, a very cordial conversation. Uh, I think we agreed to disagree. Uh, the, the subdivision ordinance specifically anticipates amendments to the subdivision plan. There's a whole section that talks about you have to have the book and page of the original subdivision recording. You have to hold, you have to notify the public if you're making the change. I think that if you are making um, a change to an area that is held in common ownership, I suggested that the real issue is right title and interest. Um, a property owner can't come to the board and ask for lot line changes when they don't own the land. So if you're deciding you want to move your lot line like this, you and the abutting lot owner both have to be participating in that decision. So I've heard the position taken before that if you want to make a change to a subdivision, all the lot owners have to agree. I, I don't think that is correct. I think that the board has to be careful that the amendment request that's being made, that the person who is asking for it has right title or interest to the area they're asking for changes. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Does anybody else have? Because I just wanted to respond to that. Go ahead. Okay. I, I continue. I take a little bit different view of the requested um, limitation here. I strongly disagree with the statement that we have already considered this traffic access question and therefore it's not on the table. We have not considered traffic in connection with the addition of a significant portion, a significant parcel of land that could in the future have access to Hannaford Cove Road. So I think the issue of traffic access to Hannaford Cove Road is a new question because we have a significantly increased parcel of land. I agree that with respect to the Wasserman property and the estate property, where the access is on running tide road. I think with the additional clarification on the ordinance and the road measurements, we have traffic information there. You have presented zero traffic information with respect to Hannaford Cove Road, zero. And I simply don't believe that the plan, I, I think that the purpose of putting this restriction as it's been requested, um, by Attorney Costigan. I, to me, the function that that serves is not to bind any future planning boards. But I don't think this planning board can make a finding 
that the traffic question has been resolved for anything more than one lot. And I think by including this covenant, which a future planning board could change, it makes that statement. Without that, I simply don't think we have enough information to satisfy all the criteria of the uh, amendment to the subdivision because I don't think it's been presented. Um, I, I guess our, our answer to that is uh, we can only have one single family residence as currently allowed. Um, any future division or development has to come back to the planning board. That's hypothetical, it's speculative. At that time when that future development is proposed is the appropriate time to have the applicant incur the cost of traffic studies and so forth if and when that should ever take place. Um, and I do find it interesting to note that um, the planning board in 2010 did contemplate uh, that, the app, that the owner of lot four could allow for a driveway outside of the building envelope. Um, and I'm not sure what the intent was there, um, but uh, I, I did find that interesting. Okay. I was actually on that planning board um, and this parcel that we're now talking about adding to the subdivision was not part of the subdivision. For that reason, I voted that any question with respect to traffic on that parcel of land was not properly before the planning board. When you now bring that property into the subdivision, to me, it raises a new issue. And if, in fact, what you say is true, and, and I agree, anyone who wanted to develop the back parcel would have to come to the planning board, and at that time, this condition could be amended, What's the basis for not including it now to make it abundantly clear that we have not addressed that issue, particularly given the varying information we've had about the suitability of Hannaford Cove Road for additional traffic? In fact, well, in fact, we have no real information. We have lots of, uh, excuse me, we have lots of anecdotes, and we have an old traffic study from the prior subdivision. Okay. All right. Oh. I'm going to ask Jonathan what he wanted to say, and then I'm going to poll the board to see their position on this particular covenant. And that will resolve whether it's up or down. So go ahead, Jonathan. I, I understand and respect Eileen's uh, position on this, but or Eileen's position on this, but my view on this is that the traffic issue, is given the fact that we have heard from Dr. Holt on the previous meeting, uh, we've seen his letter, we've heard from uh, his representatives today, that there's one house that's being proposed here. And to me, there is no need for a traffic study to be done. I know Hannaford Cove Road very well. I knew people who grew up on Hannaford Cove Road. Their families still live on Hannaford Cove Road. I understand that it's a small road. However, given that the buried subdivision was approved in 2010, these four lots were granted access. I was not, you were a member of the board. I understand that. However, one, house is being proposed, one single family dwelling. I don't see a need for a traffic study to be done on this. I take Dr. Holt at his word with regards to how he's going to see this property, how he's going to overview this property. We've been to the property. I've seen on his face how much he enjoys having those grapes and producing his wine that I understand that he's doing this as anybody would, as people have come it's ironic to me that some people have come before this board and talked about how much they love Hannaford Cove Road because it's a perfect retirement road for them. That's exactly what Dr. Holt wants to do. He wants to build a house to retire on. And given that, and given what he's done and what he's proposed to do, and actually having the foresight to buy that lot for, to build one single house, to include with, and to connect with his other 10 acres that include his vineyards, I don't think that having a traffic study would be necessary to facilitate a uh, to facilitate a, a traffic study because of one road, and I think the protections are there that if somebody is going to in the future want to propose that somebody have more or divide this uh, other this land into more lots, that they will have to come in before the uh, planning board. So I think the neighborhood is protected because somebody if wants to divide that land, will have to come before the planning board. And I don't see any more need to ask the applicant to go beyond what they've already proposed to us and include more information with regards to a traffic study when there's only one single dwelling that's being proposed. Uh, Victoria. 
uh, your, opinion on the now, covenant. your opinion on the covenant. Um, on the covenant on asking for this condition of approval? Correct. Um, I don't find it necessary to put a condition of approval in um, regarding the access to serve only one dwelling because what is in front of us is only one dwelling. And if uh, my question to the town planner was, can a further planning board with a new set of facts? So if somebody wanted to come in and put an access way, which would mean Dr. Holt's home and one additional home, they'd have to come here. If somebody wanted to come forward and put a subdivision back there, they'd have to come here. It's putting something onto a, uh, a condition that is easily broken if with a new set of facts. But the facts before us right now are one dwelling unit is being proposed and no further. So that's where I stand on that. Yeah, I pretty much agree with Victoria. Um, I, for me though, Maureen, uh, I just want reassurance that what is proposed here is one lot and cannot be increased in scope without coming back to the planning board. I know it's been stated it's numerous been stated, times. It's but been stated ad nauseum that, that anything that happens on any of these parcels must come back to the planning board before it can take place. So I would agree that since changing the size of the lot really doesn't change the traffic um, now that there's no reason to require additional traffic studies. You want to go next? I guess so. Um, I don't think there's any significant impact as described other than a few possible extra, extra trips. When I was down there on the walk, I noticed that there was some heavy traffic going up and down. Uh, at least four or five trucks that uh, went up and down didn't seem to put anybody off. Um, everybody seemed to be quite happy and there seemed to be ample room. So I don't think it'll have an impact and I think if there's any changes in the future, uh, it has to come to back Hannaford through Brothers, here. By the way. Sorry? They think they're going to Hannaford Brothers. <laughs> they think they're going to the Hannaford Supermarket Warehouse. <laughs> Uh, my, my position is I believe putting an, a, a condition of approval on this to restrict it to, to just one, one lot. I think that it's been stated that that's all the intent is at that, this time, and a traffic study is unnecessary until such time as somebody wants to do something more bold than build one house. So that's my position on this particular condition of approval. So does that, are we good? I'm now you try. I'm, <laughs> I, okay, I'm clearly outvoted here, but I, I just think we are putting the planning board in the position where we now have a large developable tract, and there is only now, if this whole property, if the whole concept is approved, there is now only one possible access for that track, and that's Hannaford Cove Road, because we're also approving something that cuts off any potential access for that property anywhere else, and we've established that it doesn't have access to the Maxwell easement. So I think when the proposal inevitably comes back to the planning board to develop that parcel, the planning board is going to be very hard pressed to say no. So I think we're creating a situation for the planning board that essentially pre-addresses the traffic problem without having the traffic information. And, and I that's think why I, and I, I understand well nobody agrees with me, Sorry. but that's my position. Well. We appreciate your position. <laughs> I know the feeling well. Any other questions, comments? Uh, there's been a suggestion that we add a condition of approval that uh, no easement for utility or vehicular access shall be uh, granted without uh, coming back to the planning board. What's the opinion on that particular condition of approval? I'd say yes. I'm looking, I'm looking at everybody. I just, I can't see putting it in if people aren't in favor of it. It's not in any written document. It was suggested here tonight. What was the suggestion one more time, please? That uh, any easement 
when Dr. Holt conveys property to the estate property and the Wassermans, that any easement that might um, include utilities or particular access be, must come back to the planning board. Was that with every uh, one of these parcels? Or just with I believe lot four. it would only be tied to this approval, this this particular division from one to three lots. So, so vehicular easements would be access ways, or would so, they be like somebody on say lot U fourteen one? It would be like the Dr. Holt wants to be able to cross the Wasserman property and the estate lot to get to the water. But wouldn't that be But so it would be utilities and vehicular access, not if he wants to mow a path. It's utilities and vehicular access. Or go the other way, give the Wasserman property access across lot four. True. More importantly. True. But, but wouldn't this be upgrading something that at the present moment is almost moot? I mean, you've got a mow It has strip. nothing to do with the current easement for the Duffets and... Mr. Rich, it's, it's, it's something that would be conveyed with the sale of the property to the Wassermans and the estate lot. And I'm just asking, do we want to include it or not include it? And I, same thing, up and down, everybody gets to give. Can I just yeah. clarify this easement that Dr. Holt may, may ask for it's something? May, yep. Is this, this is not over the tote road. This would be nope. besides? Separate. This Se is a totally oh, separate. Right. Is that totally separate. It could be in the same location of the tote road. It could be completely someplace else. The only reason this has been brought up is there is a concern that a tote road has some mysterious <laughs> ulterior conspiracy motion kind of thing. And okay. it's not. But, but uh, Dr. Holt may want to, when he retires to his estate lot, his, his retirement well, lot, mm -hmm. he may want to still walk down to the ocean. And With respect, that's not the only reason this has been brought up. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> well, it's. <laughs> so I mean, you, if, it if could the, be the only reason you would put this restriction on is if you have concerns that the tote road is more than has been described. I'm just looking to see if um, it goes into the RP buffer. It goes. It, it does. does. The, the tote road, you, you know, well, you the need tote to, road does. I'm going to, I'm going to strongly recommend that you not think of the tote road as you were used to thinking of easements, where they're in a specific place and they have a specific location and you can get a meets and bounds description. This is one of those old fashioned easements where they really don't have a good description of where it is. It just kind of goes from one point to another. But, um, um, Go ahead. May, may I suggest that if the board is inclined to consider a restriction on future easements that may be granted or reserved over the tote road, um, that it be more in line with limiting the width of the easement so as to preclude a street, if that is the concern. Um, that, I think that would maybe address the concern without limiting Dr. Holt's ability to drag a canoe or I, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about us negotiating the scope of a potential future, future easement to use the Moan path to access the water. Carol Ann, can I yes. add something? I think Maureen is talking about something completely different than I was talking about and I thought this was a good idea. And that is that Dr. Hole could grant an easement to the estate lot if, in fact, there is no possibility for access to Running Tide Road because of the restrictions there, since none of this property has yet been deeded, it's all in single ownership, upon deeding that property, Dr. Holt could grant an easement to what we'll call the Wasserman lot, although it's still Dr. Holt's lot, but when he conveys it out, he could grant an easement to that middle lot across lot four down to Hannaford Cove Road. And it could, similarly, the same thing could happen for the estate lot. An easement could be granted across the middle lot and across the vineyard lot down to lot, lot four to Hannaford Cove Road. So that entire parcel, because it is still in single ownership, could end up with access to Hannaford Cove Road. But, but Hannaford Cove Road doesn't access lot four. 
Yes, it does. Oh, I'm sorry, not lot four. The, no, it ends up at the Shirley Maxwell property, correct? The tote road does. The tote road. But lot, lot four. The right, Barry I don't believe the doctor. The Barry subdivision lot four. And since Mr. Not, okay, okay, now I understand what you're saying. Not, yeah. I was thinking of two lights road. I apologize. So that yes. if, in fact, when, that, when those, those three parcels have not yet been created, and the easements that might be given across those three parcels are not yet in front of us, so any one of those parcels, or all of them, could end up with an access down to Hannaford Cove Road. Uh, Elaine, I think we're fine with that. There, there is no desire to have the Wassermans or the estate lot cut through Dr. Holt's retirement lot to use Hannaford Cove Road. So if you wanted to preclude Dr. Holt from conveying an easement to the Wassermans or to the estate lot over his own lot four to use Hannaford Cove Road, I think we could be comfortable with that. We can't preclude it, but, but we can require that if it happens, it's, it, it becomes an amendment to the plan. So how would you word that condition of approval? That any easement for, as I think as, as, uh, as Maureen originally suggested, that any easement for utilities or vehicular access that is granted in connection with the division of the properties must be shown as an amendment to the subdivision plan. Might be the easiest way to do it. But I'm not going to make the motion, so hopefully somebody can, else can I ask it. <laughs> Elaine. So I guess one question I have is what would preclude him from connecting the estate lot all the way back through lot four to uh, Hannaford Cove Road now? Nothing. So uh, does well, this... Well, it be an amendment to the subdivision plan as it presently right, exists. Does this plan change that in any way? It adds the property to... It adds more property to the original subdivision. So it makes this requirement a requirement of this subdivision. So it clearly puts that on the table. If it was brought, if, if it happened right now, if nothing was changed, it probably would have to come up anyway. This simply makes that abundantly clear. In fact, Dr. Holt can do just about everything he wants to do here if all he did was to take the existing lot four and move the boundary back. And he could leave himself a, a landlocked parcel. That could happen. And subsequently, it could come back to the planning board to get this access. But what we're trying to do is, what I'm trying to do is to put on the subdivision plan as much as we can of the representations that are being made to us. Correct. So I have wording for that condition of approval. Since, are there any other questions? Any other, any other debate? I, my view is that I, I don't, I, take Dr. Holt at his word with regards to the, the easement, and I don't think that there's a need to put that restriction on this. How about you, Victoria? It, once again, is, is this a restriction? Well, okay, the planning board could not overrule this type of a restriction, correct? They couldn't change that. This is an Well, it would have to come back to the planning board. So it has to come. Everything still has to come back to the planning yeah. board. Okay. So you're saying if you put this restriction on, it still can be changed by a future planning board? Am I understanding that Correct. correctly? Yeah, but as Maureen has yes. said, so anything if, can be changed by a future Even an easement. I just wanted to make sure an easement. This would just be a condition. I mean, once, once there is an easement, there is the whole issue of ownership. So right. if, if, you know, if Carol Ann owned an easement and Henry came in and asked the planning board to change it, you wouldn't be able to do it unless Carol Ann was a co-applicant. Okay. So it, this just says that you really can't convey out rights without going back to the board, not that you cannot ultimately convey the metal. It, it, right. All it's saying is if, if an easement for utilities or vehicular access needs to come back to the planning board, that's all it's saying. It's not saying they must do the easement or they can't do the easement. It's just saying, and it and it's, specifically for utilities and vehicular access. And so you're saying if an easement is granted, it must be shown. Right. So that's all you're saying is it must be shown. Well, and, and if, if, if the proposal came back for an easement from the middle 
lot mm -hmm. across the vineyard out to Hannaford Cove Road. The planning board could conclude, based on the traffic information that hopefully would then be provided, that this was not appropriate and that any access from that middle property should go out to running Tide Road and if that means there's only one more lot, there should only be one more lot. But the question would be in front of the planning board. Okay, and uh, the attorney was fine with fine that? Fine with that. Okay. Uh, I believe you were fine with that. <laughs> My understanding is you were fine with that. I'm fine with language that would preclude the owner of lot four from granting an easement for access and utilities to the Wasserman lot or the estate lot without planning board approval. I think that accomplishes Elaine's concern. Yes. I want to be careful about when no access and utilities, broadly speaking, with any of the lots. I don't want this to get misinterpreted down the road. The owner of lot four cannot grant an easement to the Wasserman lot. The purpose here is to prevent the Wassermans and the estate lot from using Hannaford Cove Road. We are okay with that. Correct. Okay. So I might need to be a little word <laughs> so if that language has been captured into this not, motion. Not exactly the way he, he stated it. We're a little broader than that. Okay. She's, so I'll give Maureen her paperback while she wordsmiths. <laughs> As I say, whoever wants to make this, uh, we'll have to wordsmith that. Right. I want to okay. make um, sure that oh, whoever... Because the applicant, and we usually do go with what the applicant suggests or is agreeable to, then I, I am agreeable to it. By you, Joe. If the applicants agreeable to that, I'm good with that. Okay. I think it's the suspenders and belt approach. I think it's covered amiably on the fact that you have to come back for any changes at all to the planning board. So if the applicants okay with it, fine. But I don't see why you need both of them in there. But I'll go along with it. Can we refer to them that way? They don't exist in that state. Yeah. I think um, that any that <laughs> that any easement to the Wasserman lot or a state lot from lot four as part. Uh, you want me to read it? Yeah, your arrow. I wasn't sure I had your arrow in the right place. That any easement for utilities or vehicular access granted to the Wasserman lot or the estate lot from lot four as part of the division of the properties be shown on the subdivision plan. Okay. Are we ready for a motion? Who's, we, who wants to make it? I'll do it if you want. You sure? You got to add this to it. Yes, I know. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Forgive me if I have to reread things. Motion for the board to consider findings of fact. William S. Holt is requesting amendments to the Berry subdivision located on Hannaford Cove Road and the Broad Cove subdivision located on Running Tide Road to amend lot lines which, require, which requires review for compliance with section 16-2-5 amendments of to previously approved subdivisions. Two, the applica application is limited to merging existing subdivision lots with adjacent vacant land. Three, the application substantially complies with section 16-2-5 amendments to previously approved subdivisions. Um, therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of William S. Holt for amendments to the Berry subdivision located on Hannaford Cove Road and the Broad Cove subdivision located on Running Tide Road to amend the lot lines be approved subject to the following conditions. One, that the Wassermans lot be merged with the existing lot owned by the Wassermans located on Running Tide Road. Two, that any easement for utilities or vehicular access. <laughs> um, could you read that word for me? Granted. Granted to Wasserman's lot or state lot from lot four as part of division of the properties 
be sectioned on the to be shown on the Sub subsequent plan, Sub subject and plan. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. I see your point, but I think it's a belt of very cool. You want one of them. Okay, people, we still have another agenda item, so you could take your conversations outside. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda, Village Green Town Center Zoning Amendment. It would be interesting to do it in English you know, rather than the The Town Council is referred to the Planning Board an amendment to the Zoning Ordinance to alter the maximum front yard setback in the Town Center District when a Village Green is proposed, Section 19-10-3. Zoning Ordinance Amendment Public Hearing is our next item on our agenda. Procedures. The planner will sum summarize the amendment. The board will open for, to a public hearing. At the close of the public hearing, the bo board may begin discussion of the amendment. At the close of discussion, the board may vote to recommend or not recommend the amendment to the uh, town council. All right. Ms. Planner, go right ahead. I'll, I'll try to be quick, but we do have a wrinkle in tonight's meeting. Okay. So um, the, the, the amendment before you was referred to you by the council at the May 11th meeting, and the council has asked you to look at amending the town center zoning provisions so that a village green could be proposed. Well, why couldn't you do a village green? Well, in Cape Elizabeth, the town center is designed to be developed as a village where buildings are pulled closer to the street. There's a sidewalk, there's landscaping, there's no parking between the street and the building. And in order to accomplish this, we have not only a minimum setback, but we have a maximum setback. So if you are a property owner in, in the town center district, you're required to pull all of your buildings right next to the road. In order to do that, if you wanted to build a village green, it would have to be behind the buildings, which is inconsistent with traditional village design. So what this does is it says that if you are going to include a village green in your development, you don't have to meet the maximum setback. You have to meet other requirements. You have to meet the minimum setback. You have to meet all the other requirements. In addition, you've set up some provisions that define what a village green would look like. It has to have at least 100 feet of frontage on Ocean House Road. It has to be at least a depth of 100 feet. That's 10,000 square feet. But you have said that the actual minimum size has to be 20,000 square feet. So it allows for some flexibility in the shape, but you've got to have at least that block. Uh, one of the changes that I made since the last workshop is I was remembering a question made by planning board member uh, Fallender, and I did add the word continuous uh, in order to avoid any, um, any design where someone wanted to say do 50 feet of, of a village green and then put their building right in the middle and then another 50 feet. So it would have to be 150 feet continuous. Um, the other thing that's before you is the planning board uh, was very strongly supportive of the village green being not only offered to the town as a public space, but also accepted by the town council as a public space. And what you did is you didn't require it be accepted, but you did require that a submission requirement under the site plan review would be to obtain conditional municipal approval from the town council. Uh, I did submit this to the town attorney. He came back with um, his comments, which I believe I included in here, and he said that this is, to summarize, uh, basically a backdoor contract zoning effort, and contract zoning is not something that is, uh, is allowed in the town's zoning ordinance. So um, the town attorney is... Uh, 
is staff that advises the planning board. Obviously, we want you to take the advice of staff. However, if you choose, you do not have to take the advice of staff. Uh, what I have done is included in your package is the Village Green zoning amendment that you saw at the workshop with the change of continuous. And then I have created a second Village Green Amendment, which is called the alternative version. And the alternative version has been revised to address the comments from the town attorney. So the Village Green definition, the Village Green development definition has been revised per his comments. It refers to the standards as opposed to having more of a circular definition. And I have tried to put the changes in shade. Um, I've also, under the Village Green provisions on page four, uh, taken out the stuff that talks about um, the town having to accept it. And instead, it says that the, groom, it, that the Village Green must have legal public access and must be offered in fee to the town, which was our fallback position. And then finally, the section under site plan review where conditional municipal approval was required as a submission requirement has been deleted. So that would normally appear on the alternative version, page five, under the drawing, and in fact, there's nothing there. So those are the two changes, those are the two versions that are in front of you, and uh, your options this evening are to, after you hold the public hearing, to make changes to uh, one version or the other and make a recommendation to the council or to send it back to, the, to another workshop for further discussion. So I'm going to stop and see if there's any questions. Any questions? Um, this, this word in fee. Um, any, any, how do we? How is that set? Or is it just a penny, or a dollar, or something like that? Or the the amount is not something that we would put in ordinance. In fee refers to owning the land and not just having an easement. Okay, so it could be conveyed for a dollar, basically. It could be conveyed for nothing. That's so. a fee? No, in fee is, does it mean oh, money? Right. Okay. It means it's, yeah. it's okay. like a warranty deed, quick claim deed. Yes, okay. Okay. Or, uh, I have a comment on that. Does that also mean, though, that they could offer it for only a billion dollars? It does not. It, I mean, I know you don't want to put an amount, but at the same I time. I don't want to put an amount because we're, we're, we're crossing way beyond what is the limits of a zoning ordinance. I think the key piece here is it says legal public access, and that's not an option. So, I mean, the town has gotten, has, has gotten very, we've had a lot of experience holding public access easements over private property and exerting our rights. So. For all practical purposes, holding a public easement over Village Green is almost the same as owning it in fee. And in fact, um, you know, we've even had some people who we have had easements over their property and five years later they scratch their heads and they say, why am I still owning this if you're using it? And then they donate it to us. So I don't, see, I don't think the donation in fee is really that big an issue. I think it's the right of the public to use the Village Green without restriction. That is the important thing. And this says legal public access. So we couldn't, uh, we couldn't add language to say an offered to be donated in fee? I? I would not go there. Okay. I believe that that, I truly believe that would be the end result, but I don't think we should be including that in a zoning ordinance. All right. All right. So I'm going to open this for a public hearing. Um, Unless there are more questions for Maureen. Point. All right. Public hearing is now open. If anyone would like to speak on this particular issue, uh, please state your name, your address, and you have three minutes. Hi, my name is Paul Seidman. I live at 21 Oakview Drive. Uh, quick comment and then some questions. Uh, this week, the Ordinance Committee unanimously shared with the Council the opinion that there's no indication of any need for a multiplex development in Cape Elizabeth. My questions, uh, the first one is to Victoria specifically. 
Do you believe a multiplex and village green development, including significant deforestation and destruction of an RP2 wetland or vernal pool, is what the majority of Cape citizens would like to see occur? Okay, excuse me. We're not talking about multiplex, so please focus in on village Isn't this the setback issue? This is, this is village green, allowing a village green and changing setbacks. So Isn't it all part of one project? No. No, it is a... It is not part of any project. It is a village green ordinance which would allow development of property with a village green. And it isn't necessarily multiplex. It's, we're not talking about the multiplex. Okay, well then I'll make the statement that uh, at the August 4th, 2015 planning board workshop, local developer Steve Moore speaking on behalf of Rhode Island developer Harry Angevine stated the following verbatim emphatically, we need you to endorse that ordinance referring to the setback ordinance that Maureen referred to this evening. And I will state the position that our desire is to create an ordinance that is not written, and I know it may not seem so to you, that is not written specifically to support this particular development. I want it on record that that's what the developers said. <laughs> I won't say what's going to happen, but that is not our intent. Our intent is to develop an ordinance that allows a village green to be, what we were asked for is to develop an ordinance pertinent to village greens, not an ordinance pertinent to the development of that lot. Then the question becomes, is it each of your understandings that any, any significant population in Cape Elizabeth wants it on the east side of 77? No, but it is part of the comprehensive plan, I remember, if I remember correctly. So, all right. Hi, um, my name is Stephanie Carver, and I live at Stony, 40 Stony Brook Road. I was also the chair of the town center update, uh, plan update committee. Um, and I just wanted to speak in favor of the ordinance, so I am one of the um, residents of the town that's in favor of it. Um, I just wanted to, to make a couple of quick comments. Uh, I won't take up much time. Um, one of the goals of the plan was to create a village green that will serve as a gathering place for the community and encourage and support our small businesses like Sea Salt and Local Buzz, who have actually invested a lot of time, effort, and money into our downtown town center area. Um, they have improved the way of life for many Cape residents, such as myself. Um, and I also feel like we are now confronted with a, a, a very unique opportunity. Uh, town center has several parcels that are privately owned. They're, um, at the cusp of redevelopment, we all know that. Um, at this moment, we have a unique opportunity with any of those parcels that we might be able to create a village green and protect our small town way of life, promote um, town center as a place where residents can walk and recreate, create a place where we can have town events, post announcements, light a Christmas tree or a menorah, and do the types of things that make a community a home. Um, we can use this as an opportunity to prevent Town Center from just becoming another place to stop for gas on the way to the beach. Um, and we can show that we prioritize green space and we prioritize walkable places. Finally, and probably the most important, is that I think that a town green in our Town Center would act as the centerpiece to our green belt network and um, the series of trails and open spaces that we have is, that are so much a part of our town's identity. Often it seems like there are more opponents um, to some of these recommendations. I can say that as having been the chair of the committee. But I think, um, you know, my experience as the chair of the committee, I can tell you that the public process can sometimes seem overwhelming and, and taken over by people who might have more passionate um, voices than others or who may have the time to attend these meetings. There are a lot of people like myself who have families um, who are just tending to the chaos of everyday life and I would like to um, also additionally elderly people and disabled people who might not be able to attend meetings like this. 
I think that um, it's your job as a board to have a voice for them as well. And that's part of the reason why I'm still here tonight at 10 of 9, because I want them to have a voice as well. Um, I'm almost done. Okay. Communities throughout the country right now are building town centers. They're looking at public spaces, creating new public spaces. And I think that the intent of this green is to create that for Cape Elizabeth and preserve our small town way of life. So thanks for your time. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ann Carney. I live at 21 Angel Point Road. And I'm, I'm here tonight to express a concern I have about the ordinance. I um, appreciate and support everything the previous speaker said about the importance of a village green. My concern about this ordinance amendment is that it surrenders control over our village green to private businesses and private landowners. And um, I think that a, a village green will have tremendous value to the town if it's something that the town can control rather than private businesses. I also have a concern that the the way the ordinance is structured is that it creates a lot of inconsistency. We have many open um, areas in, in our town center. And when I read the ordinance and I try to envision in the future how this is going to affect the town, I wonder, is each one of those parcels that's um, facing potential development, is each one of them going to have a village green? Are they all going to offer the town village greens that are kind of not acceptable to the town and being able to do it and run to the ordinance? I, I do have concerns about consistency. In addition, we've seen how the town has created kind of this nice feel with like the sea salt and how that's against the road and the nice um, sidewalk and stuff like that. And then we're sort of diverging from that in a way with an ordinance that um, particularly where you know there's an offer to the town but the town doesn't necessarily have to accept it we're just kind of surrendering control um, of the development and the setback in a lot of ways to, to the whims of private landowners and I would love um, I, I personally think it would be a nice idea for this motion to be tabled and for some more thought to be put into how you know, in light of the recent attorney's opinion, how we as a town can control the development of the village green a little bit more so that it meets our needs specifically as citizens of this community. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? All right, the public hearing is closed. So any, anyone want to comment? Go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to sort of address the last speaker. If you, you pull his microphone now. Address the last speaker. You can hear it now, I guess. Um, if you look at the uh, proposal, it has design guidelines. You can't just design what you want and have it passed. It has to meet specific requirements. Um, and obviously, because it's a free country, um, though I have a British accent, um, you know, to a degree, there's some leeway in the design. But also, as the town planner just mentioned, uh, with legal public access and offered, offered for fee. In other words, it's controlled by the town. So I don't think this is just an open, an open thing. I think correctly designed and nicely designed, it's an asset for any town. And um, anybody that wants to offer that type of design would be an asset and I think it would improve the town dramatically. That's my comment to that last one. Sorry. Anyone else? Anybody else want to address any of the questions? Go ahead, Don. Just one issue, and I can understand. Um, I didn't catch your name, I think. OK, thanks. Um, that one of your concerns was whether or not the uh, whether or not the town would have ownership of the, uh, the village green. I think as a board during the workshop phase, because we have been asked been tasked with this by the town council since May, is that we've talked about this and we discussed this. But one of the things that we do want is to make sure that the town does have ownership, so that, like you mentioned, that no private business is going to have sort of some sort of 
control over this uh, this village green because we do see um, that it would be beneficial and necessary for the town to exercise that ownership of it for it to truly be a village green that everybody could enjoy. So I think that's one of the things that we have addressed uh, with regards to this ordinance. Victoria, any comments? No comments. Go ahead, Elaine. Okay. Um, I just had one thing, and I apologize that it didn't occur to me in a prior workshop, but I know we've all um, been concerned that this not be an ordinance for any particular development. And the one thing that I think I would suggest that we make some changes to is little drawing at the back. Because the little drawing at the back, I believe, came from a particular development. And in particular, the access point, it has two access points, one of which is not on a public road. And it also has a building configuration that certainly reminds me quite a bit of a particular proposal. And I would suggest that the drawing accompany this, accompanying this show all access on public roads, not through adjacent properties, and that it show more clearly what is building, what is parking lot. I can't quite tell from the way this is done. Um, because as this is shown, it looks like a fairly heavily developed property, but it might be some of what I'm interpreting as building is actually parking lot. And so I, th I think this drawing needs to be cleaned up and made a little more generic. Because in fact, this could happen, in theory, on any property that abuts Ocean House Road in the town center district. And I think that the drawing should look that way. But other than that, I would love to move this on to the town council because I think that's where it belongs. So I would love for us to be able to approve this on the understanding that it will go to town council with a modified drawing. Now, I don't know if we can do that. Yes, we can. But I would love to do that. It's a very generic drawing. No, it's not. It's a drawing that mimics a specific proposal. That's well, it says 100 feet, which is the thing. But it, this is not. Okay. Yeah, I this think that's right. a good point because All right. the majority of properties where you would put a village green are in fact just fronting 77 and don't have a side access. And I believe we can, if we choose, move this forward with the understanding that the drawing will be redone and prior to it going to the town council, it would be reviewed with the board chair. Could we not ask the person who might be doing the drawing if they agree with that? The person doing the drawing will do whatever she's asked to do. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the other thing I'd say is I don't see any purpose in forwarding to town council something which our town attorney has basically said is an end run around contract zoning. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but we have to take his advice. So unfortunately, I, I think we have to go with that and also forward that advice. Well, as I went with I went with this last time against the others, I'm in agreement for that. What can I tell you? So. I did have one question for Maureen, and that is the description, the definition of a village green development differs between the two, and I'm not sure I thoroughly understood why. Uh, the, the easiest way I can put it is the um, older definition was circular um, and the comments from the town attorney are the proposed definition of a village green you may wish to revise it to refer to characteristics of a village green in order to reduce any apparent circularity engendered by the reference to design standards so you're kind of saying any development that meets these standards is this development and you won't know that it meets those standards till you actually take it through the process and the planning board finds that it meets the standards. Okay. So, so on page five and on, oh, I see, all right. I'm on page you, one you, of No, the you've repeated the same, I'm looking at two drawings. Right. They so both say page five, so. Yeah, but you want to turn the page. One, one is alternative. One. Turn one page. I'm talking about page one. That's the alternative. One, yeah, okay, yeah. So one, one question on that point. So nothing in the new definition or the alternative de definition, I should say, 
Nothing takes it away from having site plan review, correct? No, no, absolutely you have to have site plan review. And that is where in the alternative? Uh, anything in the town center. Okay, thanks. Am I correct in thinking that what we would be proposing to move forward would be the alternative version of this mm -hmm. with the attorney's changes? I'm seeing nodding, so I'm, I'm no. assuming that. Okay. So. Anything else? Yeah, I have a question for Maureen. Maureen. So just kind of from a pragmatic standpoint of how I town green would evolve the, uh, an, a developer would still come talk to you initially about it and you would give them some sort of read on whether it could work or not and then it would come to workshop and yeah, it, let's we, let's do let's make it even more generic anytime anyone wants to come to the planning board with an application I typically sit down with them first uh, we go over what they're proposing. I go over the applicable requirements. We spend time talking about what the process would be. Um, I show them what the submission requirements are. I say you need to do a little homework in advance of the workshop. And you know, with a subdivision, I usually will start with, this is where the town owns open space right now. How is your property going to fit into the Greenbelt plan? So we start with the open space. Uh, with with the town center, if someone came in and said, I want to do, I'm going to do development town center, I want it to include a village green, I would go right to this section um, that is the design standard and say, okay, it's got to be on Ocean House Road, it's got to be at least 100 feet of frontage, what's it going to look like, how's this going to fit, have you looked at the town center design standards, we, you know, those are the type, type of things I would discuss with them. Um, and I, I my goal is to try to move them in a direction that I think you want them to be in when they meet with you at the workshop. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Good. Anything else? Would anyone like to make a motion, Elaine? <laughs> I nominate you to make the motion. <laughs> motion for the town council. Okay. Uh, motion for the board to consider. Motion to the town council, I guess. Be it ordered that based on the materials prepared and the information presented, the planning board recommends the Village Green Amendment to the town council for consideration with the following condition, that the um, illustrative drawing at the end of the amendment be modified to show access, to show all access on Ocean House Road, and that parking areas and building areas be clearly denoted um, and that the drawing be in a generic fashion not relating to any particular proposal that may have been presented. Can I ask a question? Are you re recommending the Village Green Alternative Amendment? Yeah, the, the Village Green Alternative Amendment. Thank you. Yes, version two. Do I have a second? Second. second. I have two seconds. Give it to Joe. Okay. All right. All those in favor? All right. All those opposed? All right. Go on to the town council. So, back to the drawing board. So, where's my agenda? See, my agenda got lost. You're right. There it is. Okay, the last, the last item is public comment on items that are not on the agenda. Do I have any? All right. And 21 Oakview Drive. I just wanted to add, I meant to say this earlier, that a lot of people wanted to be here, but obviously the ocean, uh, open house at the high school is taking place concurrently, so they weren't able to be. Thanks. All right. Do I have another motion? Motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. 
All right, Jonathan seconded. All those in favor? Anyone opposed? All right. <laughs> Anyone abstain? No